Dave's front office is open for business. I'm Dave Wohl, and today's visitor may be the most successful basketball player and executive in NBA history. And he's standing by, so come on in. Dave's front office is a production of Pure Hoops Media. Our host is Dave Wohl, who has spent a half a century in every conceivable NBA role except owner, but he's working on it. He's been a player, assistant coach, head coach, assistant GM, and GM. As a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, he was once insulted on the court by a ref who called him an Ivy Leaguer. Here's Dave Wall. Welcome to the very first episode of Dave's Front Office. I'm Dave Wall, and our guest today, Jerry West, needs no introduction but there's such a mountain of accomplishments and I know he hates talking about himself, so I'm gonna take a minute and do it for him. Jerry has spent 60 years in the NBA after he came in as a skinny kid with good hops after winning a gold medal in the 1960 Olympics in Rome. He's been in 21 NBA finals as a player, GM and consultant, over a third of his career spent appearing in the NBA finals. He was also named to five all NBA defensive teams, 10 all NBA teams, 14 all-star selections, one NBA finals MVP, which he earned even though his team lost. He's been voted a member of the Naismith Hall of Fame. He's been voted a top 50 player in the history of the NBA. He's got one NCAA finals MVP when his team, but he, even that one was when his team, West Virginia University lost to Cal in the NCAA finals. And he's got eight, eight NBA rings. Jerry, thanks for joining us today. Clearly, you have been a real slacker throughout your career. <laughs> well, thank you, David. Uh, you know, I feel, for the most part, really privileged uh, to have been involved with a lot of good teams. And, you know, more importantly, when you have a chance to spend uh, not only your playing career, but uh, uh, so many years involved with the Lakers, obviously that was a special relationship in my life and something that I will never forget. Um, it's been uh, it's been an enormous journey to say the least, and more importantly, uh, to watch the game evolve and and uh, uh, what's the refinements made in the game and and in terms of how players are treated, uh, their travel, uh, the amazing uh, doctors that are here today to help these athletes with injuries at one time that could could have been career ending. So. And also the growth of the NBA with uh, with a few commissioners, and I think David Stern presided over the NBA when it was in its greatest growth, and also now Adam Silver, who has continued his uh, incredible work also. I want to talk about last season um, because I think you would agree that it was the most disruptive year both in society and professional sports that anybody could have ever imagined. As you look back, what's the biggest thing or, or one of the things that jumps out at you right away? Well, David, you know, I think it would be like almost well, – forget, let's forget the sports leagues to start with, okay? Think how it has impacted everyone, the average person, the, the person who needs to work, the people who are at high risk for uh, acquiring a, a horrible virus and – the enormous cases, number of cases we're still seeing, uh, and people now are, have hopes that this <clears throat> new vaccines that are out there will help make a trend for the better for the average person. For an athlete, it's a little bit different. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I remember growing up as a kid, okay, there was always spring, summer, fall, and winter. And when fall, when the leaves started to change, it was time for basketball season, okay? <clears throat> also football season. And in, um, and in the winter, basketball was at its popularity. Basketball last year was go to a game, all of a sudden games, we had a game suspended on the night we were supposed to play. Right. And you say to yourself, well, maybe this is just an isolated case, but it wasn't an isolated case. But I think for the athletes themselves, it was an unbelievable adjustment to just getting to the point in, in the season where teams had really identified themselves, whether they're going to be really a good team or a team that was going to struggle. And they were probably already trying to make plans for next year and uh, to see, <clears throat> you know, to see where some of their younger players are. They were probably getting more of an opportunity to play. And to stop that, <clears throat> 
And then to undertake starting it up again, David, that was an enormous undertaking by the league. Uh, they've done it better than any league so far. And that's a testament to all the hard work, dedication, and I think of most importance, <clears throat> the thought process to get there where the players wouldn't be exposed and they would have a chance to conclude some kind of a season, some kind of season that wasn't in the correct order, but we did have a true champion. Right. And I feel, I said before this started, that the team that's most together from a uh, player perspective and the one that had the greatest resolve and the ones that had truly a terrific team, they were going to be the champion. And the Lakers were the one that, to me, stood out. Um, even though I was involved with Clippers, still am today, uh, <clears throat> they were the team that I thought was going to win this for sure. Uh, but even then, to watch the celebration afterwards, it seemed so concocted with crowd noise, confetti. You're used to seeing people thrilled with it respective team that they're uh, rooting for. And, you know, when they got done, uh, uh, when, when the Lakers won the championship, you, you usually expect them to come back to Los Angeles and celebrate with their enormous amount of fans. That wasn't the case. And uh, it, was just, it was just more than I could believe, number one, that they could get through this without any incidents of players testing positive. I mean, and um, but the more you learn from a David, this was probably a horrible experience for everyone uh, to be in basically incarcerated. I mean, you see your friends every day, but you miss your family. Or you miss the people you converse with all the time and with all the social media stuff today and and ability to call with a cell phone. Uh, that was something that <clears throat> at least get, gave them some relief. But every player is not different, David. Uh, and I've said it more than once. I don't know how I would have uh, prospered in that because um, I get depressed, uh, and particularly when I feel so isolated. And even today, uh, I wake up every day now. I go, get a, I go get a test every morning to be able to go into the facility. <clears throat> if you miss it, you have to miss three days to where you can't go back in the facility. So it's been a... Uh, a real big adjustment for me because I'm an outdoors person. Uh, I like to have a few friends. I don't have tons of friends, a bunch of acquaintances uh, that we used to have lunch and laugh a little bit with. And you had some, some kind of an order to your life. I have no order to my life, but can you imagine all the millions of people that have a, no order to the life today? I think that we're going to see people <clears throat> I thought when it first started, you're going to see people communicate more. I find that people are communicating less today. And uh, there's nothing really to say. Unless you see someone in person, <clears throat> you can talk to them over the phone all you want to. But unless you see them in person, it's just not the same. But the players, I thought, did a remarkable job uh, down there. And, and the league is really to be congratulated uh, for getting through that and, and crowning a champion. Uh, you know, you touched on a couple of things I was going to talk about <clears throat> later, but I, I think we'll, we'll do it right now, too. Um, you win a championship, and you remember there used to be two there, – there's really two ways the league has celebrated this. When, when you were playing, and, and I was playing, too, when you won a championship, the winning team ran off the floor. You ran into the locker room. You know, you jumped around like little kids. You poured champagne all. You rolled on the floor. It was that explosion of emotion that had accompanied that whole journey there. And then at one point, the league decided, let's keep everybody out on the floor. But the fans were in it. There was an energy. And like you said, the confetti's coming down. But there was this huge energy. And I really felt sad that the, the Lakers winning it didn't have that. Because some of those guys have had that. LeBron's won championships before, a couple of the other guys. But, but the guys that hadn't, it was like an empty arena, you know, piped in noise, no family and friends in there to kind of go crazy for you. So I, I felt bad for them with that. Um, the other thing, too, because you had spent, that you mentioned, you spent so many years with the Lakers. Did you have, do you have mixed emotions? Like, they end up winning the championship. Obviously, the Clippers fell short this year. But... But what are, your, what are your emotions when you watch the Lakers win a title? Because you spent so many years taking them to titles, building teams up. 
Well, David, you know, actually it's really pretty interesting because, you know, if you're involved with other teams, everyone thinks that you don't respect greatness, okay? You don't. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I've said it more than once. Whatever team wins, if it's in the city that you live in, you have to be happy for it, okay? You have to be happy for the city. The Lakers fans are not just in Los Angeles. They're worldwide. Right. They're all over the league. They have their own following. But to see this franchise, which has won so many times, uh, not to have, you know, the fans there with this enormous amount of noise, the pent-up energy uh, that they go to every game, that is the thing that I think is almost – you can't replace that number one, okay? I don't care how much fake noise you have. Have you ever gone to a movie studio and you see all these familiar, sometimes familiar <laughs> right. things, right. these beautiful fronts to them, and they're just a facade, there's nothing right. behind it? <laughs> yeah. It reminded me very much of that. But um, it, it, the fans who are so passionate uh, about the sport, and particularly here in Los Angeles, and I mentioned this a hundred times, when I first came to Los Angeles, you know, Dodgers, Rams, uh, they were the teams that got every right. front page, and then you were on the last page. And the last and, page, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. It was, I mean, in my new print. Um, but it is just amazing to see the change in the popularity of the Lakers and how important they are to Los Angeles. But this is, could be kind of a new, unique year. The Dodgers win uh, uh, this World Series. They played 60 games, and I think in the regular season, what, they played play 162? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> now, that, even though they win it, every team had a chance, that doesn't seem like, you know, that day-to-day -day grind. You pick up the newspaper and some team win – 10 games in a row, and then they lose eight games in a row, and the press will be all over the place, of course. Uh, it just didn't seem like a season. The NBA seemed more like a season because they played so many games. And as I say, the team that prevailed was obviously the Lakers. Now, so we have the Dodgers and the Lakers, and I wonder, can the Rams win a, right. <laughs> win a championship? So I bet the, <laughs> it really would be the city of champions, that's for sure. Um, you know, one of the interesting things when you when you talk about this year too, um, before we get into like a little bit about the Clippers, um, there was no travel, no home and away games. And I think that probably helped a number of teams and hurt other teams. Because I, I know just having spent five years in Boston, the Boston fans are absolutely crazy. You've, you've seen the Utah fans in playoffs are, are brutal. Golden State has great fans. The Lakers, other places have enormous fans, especially when the playoffs start to kick in. How much do you think that played into some of the teams maybe being able to play at a better level, they, especially teams with younger guys that didn't have to deal with the travel or some of the other things? Well, David, I don't think there's any question. Unless you had a mature team and somebody who'd been through the uh, turmoil of, of playing a, a, an NBA season uh, with all the ups and downs of travel, which late in the year, you're just waiting till the playoff starts. You pretty much know where you're going to be uh, seated in the playoff. Uh, that, to me, uh, would be a difficult task for younger players. But I do think the confinement, I don't care if you see the same thing place, faces every day. You might like them, but my goodness, you'd like to see a different face <laughs> in a different kind of environment. You know, you don't play every darn day, but in in those, I'm not really sure what the uh, uh, what the facilities were like down there. But you had to see other players on other teams who were, I guess, you know, and players know each other so much better today because of social media and, and playing against each other growing up. Um, that um, I would have just found that difficult for me because I, I don't, I never like, uh, what, sleeping in with the enemy, so to speak. <laughs> I just didn't want to see those guys in the day of the game, even though you know some of them personally have great respect for them. Uh, I just, I would have found that awkward also. And uh, it's just, I, I say, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I, I, I just hope we can, see some closure to, uh, uh, to this pandemic, and more importantly, where people, and particularly athletes, can have somewhat of a normal life. And when the season's on, David, it's not a normal life. You go there, you're trained to compete, you're trained to compete, and you're trained to excel. And that's why they use the word professional. 
You know, you brought up a point about um, just you dealing perhaps with isolation. You know, you have a tendency to get depressed or maybe anxious or something. And Paul George of the Clippers came out at one point in August and said, you know, he, he felt kind of depressed going through this, this bubble. <clears throat> And, you know, Kevin Love has been in the past, and I think Danny Green in the bubble said something too. Do you think there's still, I, I imagine there's still a bunch of players, Jerry, going through, especially this year in that bubble that, that felt that, but were reluctant to say anything publicly. Do you, think, do you still think there's a stigma for players asking for help for that? Well, David, probably, because I think people uh, look at that as a sign of weakness, and it's just the opposite, frankly. Uh, uh, trying to hide your um, your emotions that you feel that are hidden from the public, how you feel about yourself. When you, and I have a lot of days I don't like myself, uh, a lot of dark days where I don't say very much. It can make you, it can make you two ways. It, it can really make you withdraw even more, but it also can set an angry tone. That angry tone is not good. It is just not good. And, a lot of more people are starting to speak out about the mental problems associated with people see these athletes today and you know they're you know how well trained they are physically you look at them they're imposing um a lot of them are, are really the veterans who've been around a while uh, and i say somebody been a veteran who's played at least eight years right. uh, they have a different feel to themselves a completely different feel these young kids come along, they're looking out the corner of their eye, trying to emulate who they might respect and also try to learn from those people. And I'm not so sure if you care about your teammates, it's more difficult to share things with them when maybe you don't feel very good about, about yourself. And it's not like you're trying to isolate yourself from them. You're just having a bad day. <clears throat> it's like going to a game and missing uh, – you know, a 90% free throw shooter missing six free throws in a game, unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes everything doesn't go perfectly for you from a playing perspective. And, but mentally, it's much more challenging. There's no question. Um, if we go back to the start of training camp last year, um, you guys had to be feeling really good. You know, you signed Kawhi, you get PG in a trade. Um, and it probably was the, the best off season in Clipper history. And, you know, looking back, um, you're going into camp where I think you're, you're finally feeling maybe that this team has vaulted certainly into the conversation of the couple teams that have the potential to win a championship at the start of camp. Did you see any other holes you needed to fill? Can you, can you look back and say, you know, okay, we got the two elite players. We got a lot of guys who um, played well for us in the overachieving team the year before were, were there any other gaps that you thought, hey, we've got to find a way to maybe add something else? Well, David, uh, I think every team uh, that you look at, you, you know, you'd always wish you had a bench comprised of, <clears throat> you know, 10 players that you could put in a game right. and you could play them in the heart of the game, which, which is really important. Um, with the Clippers, obviously, I, I think that I, I saw areas that I thought we could be better, but we had a really good run right before this bubble started. And it looks like we're really starting to play uh, how we were capable of. But at, at the end, you know, we failed uh, as, a, as, a, as a group. Um, and it just wasn't meant to be. And, it, you know, to, to lose being up three games to one uh, to a team that was a very good team. But I don't think anyone in our – I don't even think the players believed that Denver was as good as we were. But they were better than we were in that bubble. More importantly, they were better than we were as a team. Yeah, you know, the thing, the thing that I thought was interesting, too, was all of a sudden you have um, – you're playing the season, and like you said, I think you win seven out of eight before the shutdown. And then, boom, there's this shutdown. And did, did you feel the shutdown was going to be temporary at first? Because they hadn't said, hey, we're going to be shut down for three and a half months right away. And I was curious if from internally with teams, if they thought, ah, maybe it's just a couple weeks for, until they figure out this pandemic or something. You know, what, what was your sense at that point? Well, David, I think, again, the, the answer is, is uncertainty. Even today, the uncertainty. Every, you know, everyone's talking about the vaccine, uh, who's going to get it, who should get it. Um, uh, is there a pecking order to get the thing? 
the, even the uncertainty of that, to me, goes back to that point in time. And for sure, for sure, uh, you go back and you look and you, you say to yourself, my goodness, um, why? There's no explanation why. You know, everyone wants to blame the coach. Everyone wants to blame uh, your star players. Uh, finger pointing and today in social media, which is so easy to do. Uh, I think the biggest, again, the biggest thing that I saw, uh, saw and felt and we sh this should be talked about, we failed. And we failed as an organization. We also failed with our players. Right. Um, one of the things that, I, and I want to get your feeling on this, because uh, you talked, touched on a little bit, was, you know, all of a sudden the shutdown comes. And now the players, they even shut down workouts after a while. You know, for a little while they allowed the workouts, and the facilities were all shut down. But I thought one of the things that affected specifically a team like yours that had a, trying to bring in a couple new guys, roles were changing, you had to build up chemistry, that, that I thought your team was growing and, and getting that stuff as when the shutdown happened. And then all of a sudden for three and a half months, it's like you're not together. And, and anybody who's ever tried to have a long distance relationship with a girlfriend <laughs> knows how tough that is. So I thought that inability to, to be near each other, with each other every day at practice or something really made it harder to build a chemistry in a lot of ways. Well, David, if you look at when the, when the startup occurred, the season normally would have been over about right. by then. And you, if you give players who are, again, highly conditioned, highly motivated to come to practice every day with a routine, and players have a routine, right. uh, they have a schedule they have to meet, all of a sudden you don't have to do any of those things. And I don't care – I don't care who you are. You just want to wa get away. Uh, and I would use myself an example. I would probably say to myself, well, no one's giving us any information because they don't know if we're going to have a startup or if we're going to have a season. Uh, you would probably take a week and, and uh, take a basketball and hide it because you don't want to see with <laughs> with like your best friend for, <laughs> what, for six months? Yeah, you don't want to share it with anybody. <laughs> all of a sudden, they blow the whistle and say it's time to come back. Um, I knew it was going to be difficult for all teams uh, because there is a every every professional sports has a season, right? And it compromises. They run into each other. The start up of a season, the ending of another season. I did think it was going to be difficult for all teams, and frankly, I didn't think we we're going to have uh, have a season. And if you look down there, they took votes. Some of the players did not want to play. Uh, they were concerned about the virus and what it might bring. Um, it, it presented so many problems for the league office that it was remarkable, again, as I mentioned before, that they could get this season completed, crown a champion, and get through it unscathed with any, uh, with any uh, scares or uh, uh, people turning up positive. Now, you look at all these other sports, baseball, football, Every day, they're changing games. You know, you might play Sunday, and they're changing Wednesday. I mean, if you want to watch football right now, depending on what uh, on on what the news uh, is about the respective players with their uh, with their medical procedures, and usually it's about it's about the COVID virus. Um, you just don't know when they're going to play, and then now they have to. You know, they have to. Who's, who's this player been around, who they've been close to, <clears throat> all the tracing they try to do today. Um, it, it, to me, it would have been one of the most confusing things of all. And I would have probably said to myself, you know, my goodness, how are we going to have a season? And then all the season, the season was opened up, going back basically almost to training camp. And the team that was the most ready and the most together uh, they won. And that was the Lakers, of course. You know, the thing that you talked about routine, too, you and I both know that, you know, like you talked about, as fall starts to come, the biological clock starts to tick. <laughs> it's basketball season. And every player will tell you, and it doesn't matter whether you're single or married. If you're married, your, your wife and spouse uh, start to understand it, too. It, it's a daily routine built around practice, games, meetings, and, and individual workouts or things like that. And it just happens every day. And now all of a sudden, 
the entire team is spread out. They're all at home. There's no gyms that are open for them to even just go shoot around. Some of them probably weren't able to find any consistent time to even go find a playground or something that was open to go to go shoot. So it, it like you said, it disrupted the entire usual daily routine and structure that a player has professionally for himself. And, and then all of a sudden, like, like yourself and myself, you're, you're thinking more about family, friends, you know, you're trying to wade through the health and scientific information. That How about websites. vacation? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, you know, and you and I actually texted um, months ago about we couldn't understand why people just wouldn't put a mask on. You know, because there was all this, you know, one side saying, ah, this the health stuff, don't listen to them. The other health side is saying, you got to do this. So it, it was just a confusing time. And, and I thought the structure was taken away from players and the inability to bond that championship teams have, you know, in a locker room. And you've been with enough of them that, you know, it, it's hard to recreate that when all of you are miles away on a, just on a Zoom call. There's no question, David. I, I just felt that. Um, you know, let's say that you're having a Zoom call with your coaching staff and you're a player. <clears throat> you lose this sense of in, the in-person personal part of it. You do lose that sense. But there's no way, if, if people are telling you to go out and perform, people who can shoot the ball, that's not going to be the problem, okay? That will never be the problem. The problem is to keeping yourself in shape Right. So you can compete against these incredible athletes we have in the league today. Um, and there's some players that simply are better, okay? They're the ones who, in most cases, and a lot of cases, no, they're the ones who are making the mega dollars that people are coming out to see play, that people are they're going to decide games for you. And everyone is different. Everyone is different. And when you uh, get to that the start of training camp, everything is going to change. Everything, okay? Your behavior, uh, your schedule. Uh, uh, you have to become much more punctual. You have to be here. You have to be there. Here's what we got to do this week. We got to play an exhibition game. We've got to travel this day. We're going to be back here. Uh, you have to get now. You have to get tested every darn day, every day. And uh, there's just so much more on the plate for players. Uh, when when they have time off, and I don't know what the what traditional players would do today, but let's say let's use let's use LeBron James because he's so popular and he's so been so enormously right. successful. I would have liked to have known uh, what he was doing when he did he he did not realize what what was in front of him in in terms of are we going to have a season or yeah. not? How long? Uh, you know, what was his workout habits? Did he still have the same one? I will bet you that some of them were similar, but it probably wasn't around sh about shooting unless he had a gym at his home. And a lot of players have that today. Right. But the shooting aspect would not be the problem that would affect the great players. It would be the, uh, you know, how do I prepare myself to get change my mindset to be uh, being a competitive athlete again? And, but how, how am I going to keep myself in shape? You need someone there to push you every day. You know, I, I, I thought of you right away when they had this, um, when the shutdown occurred, because I always thought one of your routines was you, you love to come in the office, say hello to everybody, kind of touch everybody. You love to go down and watch practice. You love to talk to players, you know, before practice, you kind of touch players. You might have a comment for them or ask them a question talk to a coach or two afterwards. And, and even sometimes I'd see you talking to the strength coach or the medical people or something, because I think you just had a, always had a curious mindset of, okay, what's going on with our guys? What's, you know, what's, what's a possible um, problem we might be having or, or what's really going well. And I thought that was going to dramatically change like your normal routine. Yes. And, and even just the scouting side, because you're someone that loved to watch film of players, love to pick out games you wanted to go see. And now now all of a sudden college basketball gets canceled too. So you were one of the first people I thought of. I said, what's Jerry going to do with his days now? Cause you can't even like just watch a college game on TV now. Well, David, one of the things I always prided myself with is to, to talk to players, not about basketball, but anything we could do. Do you have any, any problems going on or anything we can help you with, with coaches, you know, ask them how everything is going. It may, might be time in the season where 
people started talking about trading stuff, but uh, the trainers and everything, I, I just think it's important you pay every, attention to everyone in an organization. To me, the more friendly, uh, the people uh, who work or are involved with you, and I don't, I think if you find someone you love, you never, something you love, you never work a day in your life. Right. But I, I always felt it was important, a personal touch, uh, to say hello to everyone, to interact with everyone. And how you would treat people, regardless of whether or not you had an association with them or not, uh, I, I think you treat people with kindness. I really do. Uh, there's times that people irritate you, players irritate you, and if you go down and talk to them a little bit, uh, you, know, you might add, uh, talk to them about something and just hope you, you hope there's not a problem here. And you'd be amazed sometimes that maybe they would come in the office and just say hello and never appointment. You have, you just, the doors open. I didn't like anyone making an appointment with, uh, with me. Uh, it was just more like a family structure. And now these organizations have gotten so big and so complex now with so many people and everyone has a position. Um, I've never paid any attention to job descriptions in this sense that if, a head coach is a head coach. The players know it. Everyone knows it. Um, so to me, titles are not important. Uh, but I think everyone knows who, at the end of the day, is responsible for the success or failure of an organization. And I think that um, during my early years with the Lakers, Jerry Buss made it so easy to do because he was so personable. He interacted with the players. And his questions might be completely different than mine. And mine were only concerned about how the players are doing. And uh, if we could do anything to be better, my concern with the coaches, I did not enter, I did not ever in my life tell them what to do, tell them to play someone. Uh, that's not, that wasn't my responsibility. My respo my, I felt my responsibility was not only to the franchise, David, but really to the fans to try to try to help put the best team out there and to try to have players that they could res resonate with, and more importantly, uh, hopefully the kids would, would love them and they have something positive about them that would contribute to the community beside winning. One of the things that was going on while the players got back in the bubble was, you know, Black Lives Matters protests were heating up, you know, the police shooting of black men and women, there was, you know, the cratering economy, the election coming up, all these other things. and. I often wondered how isolated the players felt from being able to really focus on things that were important to them that they might have either joined the protests or, you know, been much more involved. They were allowed to wear messages on their back, but there were so many messages. I don't know if, if what came across was really a concerted following. So I, I really thought the bubble was hard and, and took some focus away. I'm sure from some guys that were caught in between wanting to do something on the outside, but feeling, you know, I, I really have to focus on basketball here. Well, David, for sure. I mean, it was like the sky was falling with a lot of negative <clears throat> stuff going on. Right. And I thought the one positive thing about uh, when the Black Lives Matter, the players were deeply involved in that. <clears throat> and uh, I thought players have a huge voice. And it was a perfect platform for them, but they were st all stuck in one place, okay? And I thought that was probably made a little bit more difficult, but they were being asked questions about everything except focusing on their attention to Black Lives Matter, how they could help make a difference in, um, in the minority communities, and more importantly, to make people understand that it is so important today to to take people out of poverty to, uh, to the horrible things that I've seen in my life over the years. Uh, it's just disgraceful what has happened to a lot of black folks in this country. And unfortunately, it seems to get worse and worse and worse. And I don't understand it. All of us are human beings. We have feelings, we have rights. And I happen to have two or three very close black friends. And we talk about it all the time. And one of them said to me, who's very successful, he said, you know, the thing that concerns me most is when my kids go out of the house and they might be driving a nice car and they get stopped for no reason. 
that would incense me. <clears throat> and I don't know how to this day that we can't make progress in this area. But the thing I'm hopeful of, don't forget this cause, okay? Don't forget this cause. Elections, vote for people who are truly going to make a difference and help make this a, a, a same world for everyone, not because of nationality, religion, or race. Um, I thought the players did a great job with that. A lot of players did not want to play. Right. Uh, and that tells you how they really felt about this movement. But the thing that I'm really hopeful for is please don't forget this. Please make it a talking point going forward. But more importantly, get politically people who are truly concerned and not just saying things to get elected. Um, I've seen enough of it. I think the league has done an amazing job with uh, interacting and uh, associating with, uh, uh, with the important thing to have more minorities be part of these organizations, both as coaches and more importantly, the front office. I think the league has done an unbelievable job, better than anyone, but mm -hmm. we can do more. We can definitely do more. I had a talk with Charon Liu, who uh, I drafted here in Los Angeles, who's really a close friend of mine. And uh, we were talking about him, and I said to him the other day, I said, Charon, I said, look, you hire who you want to hire. But you have been given an opportunity, as many men uh, uh, who are minority, make sure you don't discriminate them because you think it might look bad if we have too many white faces. I, I can give you a, a, a funny, not funny, but a, a stupid thing that I used to get letters from fans when I was involved with the Lakers saying to me, well, you don't have enough white players. And it was really offensive because we were having great success. I don't, I try never to look at race as anything other than someone who might have a different skin color than me. Right. Never. Uh, it's just, it's just, I was raised that way to treat everyone with respect. Unfortunately, you can't do that today. Somebody is looking for something to, uh, you know, to be just, well, they don't believe this. They don't believe it. I truly believe that this is going to be a better world and going forward for all minorities uh, because our athletes and particularly our prominent athletes, they're all black. And they have such a following throughout the world that they, their voices are going to be heard. And again, not because, uh, not because of one person I'm singling out, LeBron James has done a remarkable job in his community in Akron, Ohio. Uh, I wish everyone would follow what he's done with his life. He has really been a champion. For, for kids at risk, uh, I applaud him for that. And I will promise you going forward, and, I, and again, I know him a little bit. Obviously, you can't interact with him because of NBA rules. Right. But um, he's going to do more and more before his life is over with. And he's going to be a true difference maker. We need more athletes to do the same. Well, I think, you know, I, I agree with you because with the advance of social media, they have such a platform. And, and you and I both know that, you know, years ago, and even still to this day, there are people who say, oh, the athletes, they should just play. They shouldn't say anything, you know, because they want to hold them down. They don't want those um, opinions and, and things to come from them. And, and I think they've just scratched the surface of what they can do in terms of getting out messages of inequality and mistreatment and things like that. And, and I think we all agree that it'd be a great world if, if, you know, you didn't even care what color anybody was. You went to hire somebody just because you thought they were the best person and nobody was going to second guess you if you didn't hire a person of a certain color or a certain gender or, or, or something like that. And we're certainly not there yet, you know, but I do think that they have a platform that they've just scratched the surface on. And hopefully, like you said, the movement doesn't die or slow down. They just recognize it and keep pushing it because, you know, I've heard people say, well, my voice, my vote doesn't count. And I said, hey, your vote is your voice. And if you were in a meeting, you'd speak up. Well, use that. It, it, you don't have a voice if you don't vote. So, uh, you know, you and I are, are, have been in agreement in that for a long time. Well, David, um, you know, there's some players are true leaders, okay? They really are. Uh, and if they're leaders, they're probably very prominent, okay? 
Uh, I truly believe that LeBron James could be anything he wanted to be in this world. I do. Uh, he's a leader. Uh, he's a leader that has a voice. He's smart. Uh, we have other players of his, uh, of his same stature as players. Not They will never be as great as him, but in their own right, close to him, who would have the same voice. And I think they need to get involved and in, in with him and have some kind of alliance of star power, of wealth. And unfortunately, in this world today, everyone seems to be defined uh, what they contribute to society by how much money they make or how, how financially successful. That's not a measure of a person at all, David. It's not. And uh, these athletes have a, few, a huge voice. Uh, uh, Chris Paul has a huge voice, great respect. Uh, again, he's one of those people also. But there's numerous players out there. If they would just – and I guess it might take some courage. I don't know. Right. Um, you know, be who you are. Talk about what's wrong in this world. Talk about the things that are not fair. Uh, I'm just hopeful we'll see more and more players do that. Um, you know, getting back a, a little bit now to the to the playoffs. So, um, you know, the you come out of the playoffs. Uh, we had three guys with deaths in the family, I think, on the Clippers, and and a couple guys had COVID. I think uh, Zubac and Shamit were quarantined for a couple of days. So, anyway, you go into the playoffs. You win the first round. Tough De uh, Dallas team. What were your thoughts on Doncic? I, I mean. Doncic, I thought, was just phenomenal. He was the closest thing, Jerry, and you and I, because I've been with the Lakers when he was there. He was the, he's the closest thing I've seen to Magic Johnson. Well, he's amazing. He really is. He's one of those transitional players that, uh, uh, you know, I call them decade players. They don't come along very often. And obviously, uh, uh, where, where did he go in the draft? Fourth or something? Well, yeah, like I think, that. yeah. Where, wherever he went. Uh, I think back and, uh, you know, I know that in talking to our scouts and everything, uh, he would not have gone third, but uh, that's after the fact. It was always great after the draft. draft <laughs> Hindsight. <laughs> and, uh, um, but he is just a remarkable player. He plays with a joy, his size, his ability uh, uh, to rebound, to pass the ball. And you can see the players have enormous respect for him. And he, he, you know, he always has this kind of smile on his face when he plays. Um, again, he kind of remember, remind me of Irvin Johnson a little bit there. Um, it's, he's just a remarkable player. And David, he's so young, just as Irvin was when he first started. Uh, he's so young. He's going to get better. And uh, they're going to be another formidable team. They got better. They, they made a really good trade for themselves. And they're better. Uh, but you root for players like that because this is what draws fans. And what's the most important thing? If it's like, I remember when I was younger and go to New York and I'd never seen a Broadway play in my life. And being from West Virginia, we don't have anything like that in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to go there and I said to myself, oh, my God, what am I doing to do there? But the enthusiasm when, when, when the play was over um, – I learned to have a great appreciation from some of those really all-time great Broadway shows. Right. And always the star of the cast was the one that you, that led, that led this group. Right. And I can see him as one of those. I see LeBron James, of course, Irvin Johnson. These are generational players. We don't see them very long because their ability not only to be great themselves to make, their, but make their teammates better, and when you have one like that on your team, it's like having three players because they're so versatile. They, uh, they instill confidence. And, you know, it would be – if you went out on the floor every night and your team was for three straight years and you won 25 games, there's not a lot of nights that you're going to go out there and feel like you have a great chance, no matter how hard you play. Right. right. Put that one guy in there, and you might go from 25 wins to 40 wins by having one guy out there but he's going to make the other players better and people love to watch him play. So anyone who can draw fans to a game uh, to me is a superstar, not the ones that just go out and get money. 
Plus, I mean, like you said, I think, you know, he's got a, that half smile on his face. He, he loves being out on the court. He loves playing. You know, sometimes you watch a player, even some of the good ones, and it feels like they're carrying away around a 500-pound weight just to play basketball anymore. <laughs> so I, I just enjoy watching him play because he's got that vibe about, this is fun, man. I don't I, This is my job. Are you kidding me? You know, this is great. Um, you lose to Denver in the second round, and – uh, I two questions for you. Did you did you see um, the growth of Jokic and, and Murray to the to the extent where they are when they first came in the league? And if you had seen them before when you scouted? Well, you know, I didn't see uh, Jokic play, uh, play at all. But my goodness, he was drafted in the second round. Think of all the people. Yeah. <clears throat> it's upon him. But he's one of the most gifted big guys I've ever seen. He's not a great athlete. He doesn't run pretty, <clears throat> but he thinks like he thinks like an Irvin Johnson, a Magic, uh, a, Ma uh, a Larry Bird, uh, a uh, Chris Paul, uh, 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 LeBron James, and he's seven feet tall. He yeah. uh, he watch him and he shoots shots and he say, "Oh my God, this has no chance." But David, the key to him. He has incredible hands. If you look, yep. if you look at a rebound, four or five guys are there, and he just reaches up his hand, and he can be right in the middle of eight hands, and some ball that ball comes out in his hand. Uh, he's just remarkable, fun to watch. Um, he looks like he's when he's playing. He looks like he's playing in a hammock. He looks so relaxed and just <laughs> you know, relaxed and playing the ball. Jamal Murray was unbelievably great in the bubble and he has grown by leaps and bounds i'm not so sure he might have surprised himself a little bit and you can imagine going forward to a new year what his confidence is going to be like yeah i thought one of the things with Jokic, i thought as as you look at yourself as a player back then how much fun it would have been to play with a guy that could pass like that too because he's one of those centers it's just touch passes you know he's already seen the the two cuts ahead of you and he know, he knows where that ball's got to go it just has to be fun for his guys to play with him cuz all you got to do is move and get open and you well, know David, that's not that's, that. that's not the only point he's but he you know some people just see you open they throw it behind you it might be a turnover <laughs> and and he puts it right where you need it every time he's like a a classic NFL quarterback, uh, Aaron Rodgers, my goodness, stands out. Uh, obviously, Tom Brady, uh, mm -hmm. you know, wherever, wherever they're going to th throw the ball, that ball is right there. And no, and it looks like everyone would have a chance to get it. No. It, it is timing impeccable. You know, standing outside and, and shooting off one leg and making shots, <laughs> everyone says, well, that can't go. He practices that stuff all the time. So it tells you the incredible hands he has. An amazing touch, but he's just blessed with this genius mind, as all of these players, LeBron James, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, all, all those guys are blessed with that. So, you know, you lose that. It's, it's obviously disappointing. Um, you make some changes. You bring Ty Lue on as the coach. Um, Ty's got to hire a whole new staff for him. And then in quick order, there's, you know, you're allowed to make trades. You've got the draft. You've got free agency coming up. It's like this compressed thing all of a sudden. And then you find out that, oh, okay, we're going to go into the season again, December 1st for training camp. So there was like no rest for the weary. But at the same time, all of a sudden, now you've got to figure out new protocols for a season. And, and as you look forward to this, and I thought you guys did a good job picking up Ibaka, you know, you lost Trez, but Ibaka and, and, and Kennard may offer a different kind of complementary skill to the, the kind of offense you want to run because of their ability to, you know, shoot threes and, and, and pass the ball and stuff. And Ibaka can defend multiple positions. So, <laughs> so what were your thoughts going back now? Okay, now we, we, we have a new staff. We're coming into the season. What are you thinking about for this season coming up? Well, David, it's really hard to tell. Uh, we have not played very well in preseason. We have, a, you know, a, when you have an, a whole new coaching staff, I've been very impressed with them. They've done a really nice job. But uh, as I say, to say that, that uh, you know, we're going to be where we were last year, I don't know that. Um, it's, it's, always, it's always a crapshoot when you change teams, okay? And uh, many times – you don't have any choice. Uh, if someone doesn't want to come back and play for you, you don't have that choice. That's what's great about being a free agent. And uh, 
uh, this team has uh, has we have talent. There's no question we have talent, but it's going to take a while to put it together. And frankly, uh, if we can, you know, move along in this season uh, in a positive note, we would be in probably a little bit more dangerous in the playoff because the games slow down uh, a lot, and uh, uh, that's when your better players have more of an opportunity to be. Uh, be set offensively, uh, but more importantly, defensively. And we have some premier defenders on this team. And if I would gather to uh, to look at it the way I think about it, we have to be better defensively every night. Next week, in part two of our conversation with Jerry West, this Hall of Famer who defines grace and class shares his thoughts on how the competitive nature of the players has evolved. Here's a preview. I was watching last night on YouTube, which is really funny. All the old fights in the NBA. Oh, David, there are some bad ones, okay? And, and today, we don't see that anymore. So the league has done a great job policing this and making this a, a gentleman's game. I don't think it should be a gentleman's game, and it's not It's not in the playoff, and that's why I enjoy the playoffs so much. Yeah, because sometimes you'll see two guys bump into each other, and they, they almost want to have a fight, and you're kind of laughing because back then, that wasn't even, you know, anything. It was going to be a fight. <laughs> Jerry West, part two, next week on Dave's Front Office. Take care. Dave's Front Office, with your host, Dave Wool, is a production of Pure Hoops Media.